Well, hello, everybody. It's great to see you again. Um, before I get started with the topic of today's lecture, I want to once again ask you, any, any of you who may have uh, suggestions for memes or viral video topics that you'd like to see for further lectures, I'm kind of uh, running out of um, topics that I think I'm, uh, I'm wanting to do for this series besides just writing small things in the book. So um, if you want to see this going, send me, send me requests. I do requests. Um, I'm also going to make this announcement over email, um, but I have enough for at least a week or two left um, without any help. But with help, um, I could torture you some more. It, it sounded like from your intro that the university professor meme might be a good one, too. Oh, always. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that can never hurt. All right, so let me share the screen now, which is always loads of fun. Today, we're talking about squatting slobs. Um, and here are a couple of them. Now, of course, it's a funny image. Um, and the image of, of what is called the squatting slobs, the terminology I think is rather interesting. It's called the squatting sl slobs in English um, for the alliteration um, to deal with the fact that most of the time we're talking about people not just from Russia, but also from Ukraine and Belarus. So it um, has some real currency in Serbia as well. Um, it's not called squatting sl slobs in Russian. In Russian, it's images of gopniki, and we're gonna get to what the gopniki are. This, is all, this all has been very big on the internet starting around 2012. Um, and this is a phenomenon that um, is one of those great moments that it's big on the Russian internet and big on the uh, uh, non-Russian internet as well. It's really, it really took the, the West by storm around 2012, 2013, which begs the question, why? Um, why are images of, um, of squatting Slavic men in track suits um, such a, uh, why were they so appealing um, as memes online and what could it possibly mean? So to talk about that, we need to step back a bit and think of some of the issues that have come up um, in previous lectures. Again, this is not a quiz, um, but I'm just reminding you of some of them. Um, we need to th and we also need to think about the question of um, self and other, that is, who is doing the represent representing and who is being represented. And this time we're going to add in the question of subcultures. Um, and I know that I saw that Julie Hemant is here. She could talk much better about subcultures than I can, but I'm stuck talking. Um, Julie, you can correct um, all my errors when we're done. Um, Okay, so remember when we're talking about the dash cam videos and John Stewart's generalizations about how you know, the average Russian woman can take apart a car and um, Russians are so blase, and there was a real issue of um, an exoticism that helped make these videos funny and helped make them appealing, but could, if you stop and think about it for more than two seconds, make you a little bit uncomfortable with how this is all being, um, all being uh, framed. Um, now, when we talk about the gopniki, about these squatting slobs, we have questions of exoticism. We have questions of um, holding up images of certain types of people to be made fun of. Um, and we have uh, the general question of why um, people are looking at them. And part of the answer is that the internet loves freaks. And by freaks, I mean not some sort of category that um, is um, agreed to by all, but a category of people who are received by um, people on the internet as strange or freaky and funny and therefore um, ready for ridicule. This is not specific to the Russian internet, it's specific to every internet um, community I'm familiar with. We, and we love to make fun of freaks and we make fun of our own freaks. This is important, but there's, it can mean different things when, you're, um, when the subjects you're making fun of come from your world as opposed to someone else's world. And then this can be negotiated in terms of how much these people represent you and how much these people represent the kind of stigmatized subset um, of your own culture. In America, we have a long tradition of um, making fun of um, cultures that go back to the notion of white trash. Um, one of our, um, uh, one common idea is the, um, sorry, why is this not letting me move? Hold on a second. Oh. I am, I can't move my screen, my, I can't move my, um, my uh, presentation. I'm stuck on the slide. It's not letting me move. Elliot, do we have the slides? You could. Um, if you want to, do you want to email them to Sasha and me and then one of us can share them? Yes, if, if I can get a... out of here. Yeah. Um, one second. I'm, I, I, I'm sorry. I found that. another, are you in full screen view? Are you on a computer? I am, and I'm trying if to. If you go out, of, out of, if you go out of full screen and then back into it, you might. Right, I pressed escape, um, and it keeps giving you that sound like I'm having a problem. Um, okay. Uh, 
This is not the computer I'm used to. My cursor is disappearing. Ah, there we go. Oh, there we go. Okay. Good. All right, Florida. So we have, um, in America, we have the Florida man. Um, the Florida <laughs> man meme is quite familiar. Florida man is um, a basically uneducated hick who does something crazy and then is offered up for our own amusement. Um, he was turning into... He, he's a familiar meme. He's made fun of on talk shows. Um, he was an entire, he was the basis of, a, of an important character on um, The Good Place. So usually he's white, the character um, on The Good Place was not. Um, but it's a, it's a way of isolating um, a, part of our, a part of our community um, as the ridiculous yokel part. Um, okay. Ah, it's letting me click. There we go. All right. So, um, we also have, um, so in America, we also have phenomena like you might recall, Here Comes Honey Boo Boo, which was an entire seven season show devoted to making fun of the category that is usually called white trash. Um, and again, when you are laughing at it, you know what you're laughing at. You are putting yourself in a particular subject position in relation to um, these people whom you can look down on as um, kind of freaks. But you're looking down on it still from within, within the country that um, produces these freaks. You can have a sense of, of shame about it perhaps, but it's not someone from the outside making, um, making fun of them. Um, we also have the Jerry Springer show for decades um, specialized in um, this kind of enjoyment that you can have by having, um, by having low class, um, trashy people um, served up for entertainment. Um, in Russia, this is, we have the same thing um, in memes and viral videos. We have a lot of emphasis on, um, on poor, homeless, drunken old people um, who, are, um, who are ridiculous. So for instance, there is, okay. I'm gonna play, I have two videos of this for you. I don't have them translated, but you don't really need to know what they're saying. You need to, to watch how they're saying it um, and to know that in this case, this person is speaking a great deal of nonsense. Oh. If I can go back. No, more than go What is it? I work in this organization. I worked as a copy of the Avset. I received a lot of what? In Soviet time. You know, I copied. I copied. You know what? The culture of our country. Вот, в свое время я печатником был, вот здесь, звезда, звезда. А, зовут меня Николай Васильевич Першков. А как вы считаете, сколько, по вашему мнению, должен зарабатывать успешный человек в нашем городе? Стой, минутку. Ты знаешь, что я? Yeah, war. <laughs> so, for those of you who couldn't follow, um, this uh, not quite sober man who keeps burping talks about that he was a printer and he printed our culture. Um, and when he's asked how much money someone should make in their town, he says, you know who I am? I'm a thief. Um, none of this makes particular sense, but um, this guy and the other guy whose video just sort of went by and I'm not gonna try to get it before, get it back, um, are, were rather popular um, viral phenomena um, that were um, set up for us to, to make fun of. Actually, let me see if I can get that one guy back. The other guy is a bigger phenomenon. Um, nope, he is not coming. Okay, so um, the gopniki, these people um, squatting, um, are also um, served up for our entertainment um, and not exactly served up for, for edification. So you might ask yourself, who are they? Um, and again, in Russian, they're called a gopnik. Um, the phenomenon of the, of the Gopnik goes way back. And just as um, with uh, earlier in, um, in, this, in the lecture series, like I, um, when I was talking about Shmo, um, I was saying that there's a uh, disagreement about the etymology and there's one um, explanation that has to do with abbreviations. Um, there's an explanation for abbreviations too that I find rather suspect. So Gopnik um, refers to a uh, young, usually man, um, street person, uh, low class who, um, hangs on the street, is threatening, uh, might be uh, sort of asking or demanding money from you, um, doesn't seem very intelligent, hangs out in groups, um, and might beat up people who are different from him. Now, um, in terms of the etymology, some people go back to um, the late 19th century, uh, 
and suggest that it actually comes from uh, the either from the Aksyabrskaya Hotel, which starts with an O, or um, from an organization called the Gosudarsnu Obshva Prizora, the um, oversight, the state oversight um, commission um, that was supposed to look after uh, street children. And then later after the October Revolution, there was a suggestion that that GOP comes from Gosudarsnu Obshvjiti Proletariata, that is a state um, state proletarian dormitory. Um, and the sheer number of different um, abbreviation explanations um, to me makes it much less likely that, that, that um, that's what it comes from. Go, there, are other there are other phrases with gop in them. There's gop stop, which is a kind of um, uh, street, uh, sort of a mugging. Um, but there isn't any one particular um, agreed upon etymology for the gopnik, except the gop with the understanding that the, the term gopnik has been around for about a century, um, but has waxed and waned in its importance. And um, the Gopniki became a more significant phenomenon in the 1990s, which makes some sense because of um, the upsurge in crime um, and the concerns about um, dangers on the streets. Now, um, this begs the question, um, are the Gopniki even real? Is there, are there a group of people whom we could consider Gopniki? Um, in terms of thinking of them as a group, the, it's a problem in that while they're often discussed in terms of subcultures, um, people whom other people would call Gopniki do not identify, usually identify themselves as Gopniki. Saying I'm a Gopnik is not something that someone usually um, volunteers for themselves. It's um, a label that is applied to them. Um, so the result is that if you have a bunch of lower class guys who are threatening or beating people up, um, they can automatically be assimilated to the category of Gopniki. Uh, so this suggests that there's a real class element here to it, that it's a matter of looking down or, or being um, threatened by um, the lower class. But it also has a, um, a it also has some ramifications for the hierarchy of crime and danger from crime, um, because the '90s, of course, were a time when everybody was more and more anxious about crime, about violence. The Gopniki, um, they weren't, you know, um, drug lords. They weren't mafia lords. They weren't even um, enforcers. They were really low level. Um, they represented a threat, but a, um, a relatively um, domesticated threat. A domestic might not be the word because they're really the culture of the streets. Um, so on the one hand, they're, if they're a criminal element, they're a criminal element that you're likely to run into, much more likely than, say, the leader of a, of a mafia group. Um, on the other hand, on the whole, um, they're uh, less dangerous than, say, um, some armed enforcer for, uh, for a, a gang. Um, they went, but um, they share the kind of general 90s um, criminal and criminal adjacent um, aesthetic, the tracksuits, of course, being a big part of it, the cigarettes hanging out of their mouths, and um, in the case of the Gopniki, the squatting. So it's these squatting guys in tracksuits that are really big on the memes. The memes really take off um, in the West on 4chan um, in 2012. Um, and there, uh, Christiana uh, Naidionova, in an article a few, uh, a few years ago, um, notes that if you look at uh, Google Trends um, for searches on the topic of squatting Slavs, uh, in August 2014, the trend starts to get noticeable and reaches a peak in August 2017. In November 2017, you have the opening of the Facebook group Squatting Slavs in Tracksuits, which had 770,000 likes and was, likes and was created by a Romanian teenager um, who has now been interviewed several times, um, who didn't come up with a meme himself, but just thought it would be fun to make the group. Um, since then, there are lots of different Facebook groups. Anyone, who, if you just search Gopnik or Squatting Slav on Facebook, there are plenty of um, groups you can join to give, uh, give you more and more um, images of Gopniki. Um, so the Gopnik then becomes, like so many of the mimetic phenomena and viral phenomena that I've been talking about, um, has this nice back and forth between the world of real life, that is the streets, um, the internet, and then um, other realms of cultural production. So um, rather quickly, the Gopnik, his slang, his um, attributes um, become available as a figure for um, all kinds of satire, including most um, amusingly, oh, here's another Gopnik. Sorry, you gotta get to some more Gopniki. Oh, here's a Gopnik saying, um, with this line, Mama, I just found out that I'm a Gopnik, meaning of course, you know, you don't identify as a Gopnik. Here's a scholar and motor as Gopniki. Here's the Sukhobiet Gopnik thing, you had to have that um, brought in, of course. Then there's a journal set up in, 2013 called Gopares, which is all, which is basically, um, if you imagine Glamour magazine for Gopniki, um, it would be Gopares. Um, it's sort of a Gopnik, it's, it's a 
it's a satirical Gopnik lifestyle magazine um, where you have images after images of Gopniki, um, advice columns on how to be the right kind of Gopnik, how to learn your Gopnik slang, how to intimidate someone so you can get a free cigarette, um, how to intimidate someone so you can get some cash, um, how to pick up girls. Uh, there are three or four issues and also a um, spin-off magazine called Bratish. Oh, sorry, here we go. I'll show you a few. Um, basically, it's sort of the cover is kind of Gopnik of the month. Um, notice the missing teeth. That's a very common attribute with um, um, when you have the chance to actually make up your own Gopnik. Um, and again, and um, here's from the inside of the magazine. It says, I went out to get um, some bread. I came home with a smartphone and he has his um, brass knuckles, which suggests how he got it. But it's like an advertisement. You can do this too. Um, here is a sort of guide to um, what you know the attributes a Gopnik has, how to be a Gopnik. There's a squatting with his shashlik and um, and his hat and so on and so forth. Um, here's an interview with a Gopnik. Mir um, the world of so Chotki here. It's part of the Gopnik slang, um, but it's um, more stuff about Gopnik attributes. Um, so you can get this magazine for free online. Um, and again, it's kind of a lifestyle culture thing. You also have a number of memes of the, of the kind with, um, you know, the picture and then the words on the top here. It says, um, do you want to, do you want to go out with me? And if I ask, so there's a common thing, a notion that, uh, a Gopni comes up to you, um, and asks if you have any money and you say no. And he says, and if I find some as a kind of threat, you know, if I find some, are you going to give me some? So if I ask you, are you going to go out with me? Um, all right, hold on. There's a new Ukrainian guy working in my factory. On every break, he just goes to, to a corner to smoke a cigarette while doing a Slav squat. Obviously, um, a Western Gopnik meme. Um, here, uh, the, basically, this is a rhyme um, involving going out um, and getting a, a, a drink. Here's a Gopnik on the moon. Here's a, a cat Gopnik, because of course, if it's on the internet long enough, it has to have um, either pornography or a cat, or worst of all, both. Um, and let's see. Um, so uh, we, I bought a whole lot of electronics, um, and there's no one for me to uh, to bum a cigarette off of. Okay. So, anyway, um, it all comes back though to this whole th image of the squatting. The squatting, the squatting is crucial to all of this. I'm trying to go backwards here. Please let me go backwards. It's not letting me go backwards. Okay, um, I'm stuck in this loop here. Um, why is the squatting so important? Of course, all around the world, people squat. People know how to squat. However, there is a kind of hierarchy of um, facility with squatting and commonality of squatting. Americans, for instance, are not particularly good at squatting. Um, it's not something we do very often. I don't know so much about Western Europeans um, in this factor, but um, there are a couple reasons why squatting um, varies throughout the world and, and um, why it's marked in certain ways. So in America, for instance, um, we sit on floors. This is, this is taboo um, in a lot of cultures, especially if you're concerned with the um, hygiene of the floor. Um, American small children are um, at school, in daycare, are always sitting on the floor. They're learning to sit crisscross applesauce, as we call it now. We used to have a much worse way of calling it when I was a kid. Um, and um, I remember many times uh, what, having Russians watching American kids do this and trying to get in the same position and finding it difficult because you, they did not grow up um, being crisscross applesauce on the floor all the time. There's the, the reasonable conception that floors are not clean. So what do you do if there's no chair um, and your options are stand or sit on the floor. There's an intermediate option, which is to squat. Um, and there are all sorts of pictures from Soviet times and later of children squatting um, in schools. Um, squatting is something you do. Um, and especially if it, it, it is an alternative to um, floors, because as we know um, in sort of Russian folk life, um, floors are dangerous, cold is dangerous, you can freeze your ovaries, you can freeze just about any internal organ from contact, contact with the cold, so you stay away um, as much as possible. But there's also the, the um, basic fact of what squatting looks like. Squatting is reminiscent of what um, in English is disparagingly called the Turkish toilets. Um, and, it's what, um, and it's reminiscent of what a lot of toilets were like you know, throughout the Soviet Union. Squatting is a position for defecation um, and perhaps for urination. Um, it takes a lot of leg strength to squat like that. These, um, these are not the squats that your trainer might be um, 
asking you to do if you're at the gym, and it's not a particularly flattering look. And so what happens with squatting, um, with pictures of squatting, even though people around the world squat, the picture of the squat um, is a way of, uh, ends up marking the squatter as uncivilized, Eastern, wild, barbaric, um, uncultured. Um, and this is where the internal external thing is, is rather interesting because of course, um, presumably people throughout, all throughout Russia squat and know how to squat. But squatting on the streets like a gopnik is marked as an uncultured low-class behavior. Um, uh, that the squatter is an, is an element you do not want to associate yourself with. Also because these men who squat, um, one, of the one of the associations with the, perhaps they spent a lot of time squatting um, on the ground in prison camps where also you don't have um, a great deal of um, available comfortable seating. Um, now the, the thing connected to the squatting is it's all about public space. I mean, some of these pictures have people squatting at home. Presumably if you're at home, you have a chair um, or, a, um, yeah, yeah, or a couch or something. But um, the, the Gopnik is squatting on the street. He's making a claim to public space. Um, where there's no space to, to sit comfortably and no place to gather. So you make it your place and you're in, the Gopniki sitting around, um, squatting on the street are marking territory. Um, and in this, I like to think of him as the natural enemy of the babushka, um, the grandmother who I had. Ugh. Okay, you know what, I'm, oh, there we go. I'm out of, to um, the babushki um, who, who monopolize the few places on the street where you can sit that is outside of every entrance of every apartment building, more or less, there's a, there are benches and there are babushki, um, old ladies sitting on them. And their job is to enforce public order, to enforce um, standards, to, um, to tell you you're doing something wrong and to tell parents that their children have done something wrong. Um, they are unofficial guardians of a public order. And so this particular meme um, has these babushki looking at it and says, um, I don't, we don't have time to explain to you that you're a prostitute. Um, this uh, inherent judgmentalness and this wonderful setup, the most, the, the, um, this is the, the uh, most frightening um, ordeal. That is the, the gauntlet of passing through the babushki as they are um, judging you. The gopniki turn public space, the street, not, not the space outside the home, um, the street into another kind of gauntlet. They're squatting kind of like gargoyles um, uh, threatening you um, outside in, in, um, on the street. The power, their power depends on their physical presence and their possibility of being intimidated. Um, it's ridiculous when transformed into an image, they can't hurt you, they just, look, they just look absurd, but on the street, they could be menacing. It is distance that ren renders the Gopnik a figure of fun. Um, in 2010, the TNT National Television Channel began broadcasting a scripted parody of reality shows um, in the provincial town of um, Pirm called Realne Potsani, Real Guys. And it's a play on words about reality that real people, and also the, word, the use of the word Realne as a kind of like ordinary, good, like solid guys. Um, and it's supposed to be the reality show of this guy, Kalyan. He's the one um, uh, on the left an image there, who um, as part of a rehabilitation program after some sort of petty crime is going to be fil filmed as he is learning to live a better life. This show is so popular. Um, it's been going on for 10 years now, has over 200 episodes. I'm on episode 46. Um, I can fill you in later, but basically um, things get better and better for our Kalyan. Um, and eventually the Gopnik is so, um, the Gopnik is so assimilated into mass culture that Gosha Rybczynski, the um, streetwear designer, has a um, collection of Gopnik-inspired fashion um, on the runway in 2016. So as individuals or groups of actual people, the Gopnik have been domesticated. Um, but as an un unindividuated category, the, the notion of the Gopnik is still really powerful um, as a symbol of um, the unwashed, stupid people um, whose, whose um, primitive thinking could actually help ruin the country. Um, in addition to Gopnik, there's the term Gopata, kind of collective noun, like a sort of, like a, a murder of Gopniks or, a, you know, a pleather of Gopniks. Um, and the phrase, um, um, there's a phrase uh, that means the Gopnik masses, um, the, tri the Likuyushe Gopata, the triumphant Gop Gopnik masses, that um, there's a group of people, there's a sort of amorphous group of people out there who are as crass as the Gopnik, um, who are breaking up anti-Putin demonstrations, who are the, um, the uh, so a base of support for the, for the regime um, and who are kind of irredeemable. 
So Gopnik style has conquered the runway. The squatting Slav has a comfortable home on the internet, but the triumphant Gopnik masses still point to an elite discomfort with the ordinary citizens of the Russian Federation, um, who are always, it seems that there's a contingent always ready to um, consume imagery of a certain type of Russian or Russian category who is um, backwards looking in every possible way, who is there to be made fun of, who represents everything that is kind of um, negative about the country, but is also potentially can be turned around into a kind of um, figure of fun that you can admire from a distance and even um, adopt elements of style from. So that's, um, that's really what I wanted to say about the squatting Slav and the Gopnik for now. And I'm happy to take any questions or comments. All right, um, if, if anybody has a question and they want to raise their hand or submit to the chat, I am ready to take them for you. Uh, I, uh, it's Nancy, I stuck a question in the chat, Elliot. Yeah, yeah and you asked about how the Gopnik would compare with punk. Um, yeah, I mean, I understand which each of them is, but I'm interested in what you would say side by side, particularly in the in the prison yard, squatting in the prison yard. Seems to sure. me it unites them. Well, punk as a as a phenomenon in Russian, that would be called punk. Punk here, people that the Gopniki would be beating up. Um, so, w because one of the things that that um, characterizes the category of people who would be referred to as Gopniki, um, starting in the late '80s and '90s, is that they're the people who would see people who are stepping out of um, the bounds of conventionality, like a punk, like a hippie, like um, uh, or like you know certain gays and lesbians, um, who. Um, their very presence on the street is seen as a provocation and they would be beaten up. Um, so, because in, 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 unless I'm wrong, in Russian, punk doesn't have, a, have a, the history of associations that it has in English with um, just a kind of um, rude street kid and someone who could end up in prison for crime. Um, punk is a particularly aesthetic, um, music-connected anarchist um, phenomenon as it became in England in what like late 60s, early 70s. But I'm talking about the the 1950s sense of the, what a policeman, how a policeman might view a punk, you know, and it's older, older oh. Anglo meaning. Oh, like a punk kid? Yeah, like don't be a punk, you know. Oh. Hmm. In that sense, seems to me that there's at least affinities with with Wojtnik and and the 1950s notion of punk before it became, you know, a music thing. Right. Maybe. I mean, I see more affinities with like, like the idea of the drujina. Um, uh, the, the self-appointed people are out there um, I, I'm enforcing order more with, in a sense, more with the guardian angels. Um, yeah, I don't really see much of a connection. Okay, I could be thanks. missing it though. So we have a question from Anna. Uh, is there a female equivalent of squatting slobs? So there are images of, of female squatting slobs in, in tracksuits, definitely. Um, in, in the Gopnik magazine, for instance, the women are basically the girlfriends of, Go, of Gopniki. And sometimes they'll be squatting, but they're, they're a particular type of trashy girl, basically. Um, and when I, the images that I see of the uh, female squat, uh, woman in the tracksuit, female woman, thank you, of the woman in the tracksuit squatting um, seems more parodic than anything, because the women, women aren't usually dressed like that. Um, so the, the uh, the, pic if the pictures of Gopniki in their natural habitat, as it, as it were, are these guys in the tracksuits and these kind of trashily dressed girls um, who are part of their world. Um, but they're in the Gopnik world, but I mean, I, I never heard them called, you know, Gopnitsu or anything like that. They're kind of like biker chicks. Um, David, if you want to ask your question, I can unmute you. Um, yeah, so one thing that I, I saw in these images is that they're, they kind of resemble the, the Polish bikiniaje of the 1950s from Leopold Tillmann's novel Zwe, uh, evil translated into English as the man with the white eyes, uh, who are kind of the Polish analogs of the Stiliagi, and I'm wondering if you see mm. a connection between the, the Gopniki and the Stiliagi. Huh. Um... Not really, in the, in, in the, the, the Stiliagi's concern with, with fashion is, is something that would be quite antithetical, yeah. even though the Gopnik becomes fashion. Really, the, there's, on the one hand, the Gopnik is a Russian phenomenon, on the other hand, the, that's just a Russian um, analog to a, a phenomenon you see anywhere. I mean, in, in, um, the scholarship keeps referring to how in, in, in England, they're chavs, um, mm. 
which is a term I know just distantly because we don't use it in America, um, that um, arguably many cultures have this kind of grubby, threatening young guy um, group out there. Um, and in terms of what differentiates one from the other and the circulation of the internet, it's um, Slavs who end up associated with a squatting. Um, there's not mm. squatting chavs, no. um, as far as I know, on the internet. Maybe there should be. All right, we have a question in the chat uh, from Cameron. Uh, has the Gopnik become tied to Russian uh, nationalist groups? And if so, why do you think this is? Well, the thing is that um, I'm more convinced by a lot of the scholarship that says the Gopnik as, the Gopniki as an actual group don't really exist. Um, that um, they're not a collective of their own, that they're people that are stigmatized by others um, as Gopniki. But if you watch Realnya Patsani, that, that show, it's a kind of fascinating that um, it's all about Gopniki, um, but the only time the word is used is when someone refers to the guys as Gopniki or even occasionally says, calls them a Gopnik and say, oh, I'm not a Gopnik. Um, they don't think of themselves as, as Gopniki. Um, so sure, on the, um, it would be not unlikely to assume that guys like this, if they have a political leaning at all, would be more nationalist and um, aggressive. But um, in terms of actual subcultural formations that then align themselves with Putinism, it's more, then, then um, it gets more specific, things like, you know, the night wolves and so on and so forth. Um, it's not like anyone's out there trying specifically to get the Gopnik vote, you know, um, because by calling it the Gopnik vote, you're, you would be um, alienated of the Gopnik. Um, we don't, you know, there are people in America who presumably ask, trying to get the white trash vote, but you don't say I'm trying to get the white trash vote um, because for the obvious reasons. And with my awareness of how thoroughly offensive that term is and the, the racism behind why there is even a phrase white trash. Actually, Elliot, so I had a related question to that, if I could just jump in for a second, which is like, is I was curious about that, whether there is a sense of like political orientation here, like, would you imagine, are these folks, is, is this caricature, does it have any, is it just totally orthogonal to politics or are they proposed, is it, you know, is the idea they would be pro-Putin and anti, you know, intel, you know, democratic opposition or, you know, I'm just, I was just kind of curious that like, would these, would you associate these with like people who are at Nashi rallies and things like that? Um, with the, with the politics of that, sure. Um, I don't think they make very good, um, they're not necessarily the faces you want to show at the, at the, the Nashi, the Nashi rallies, right? But I mean, this goes back, you remember back in the 80s when um, all of, the Western Union in particular kept talking about, um, was the Lubrzy, the, the group of people out um, in that one suburb of Moscow who are beating people up. Um, they're basically Gopniki, but they were um, particularly like weightlifting Gopniki. Um, so yeah, the assumption is that their politics are going to be nationalist, their politics are going to be aggressive, their politics are going to be regressive. Um, but, um, but deploying them, I mean, they're, they're, you know, you can deploy them, they're well deployed to beat up opposition, um, but they, they don't necessarily make the, the greatest crowd to look at in a rally. Ali, can I, can I add something about Gop Stop? Yes, um, please. So back when I was doing work on prison tattoos, uh, one of the most well-known one was the prison tattoo for Gop Stop. And uh -huh. there's a bunch of them, but the most famous Gop Stop tattoo is a ring tattoo uh, on your, um, fourth finger that is the picture of a spider in a spider web and that uh -huh. can mean either I got caught at gop stop and I, I got caught mugging somebody you know hit and run right. or pickpocketing or that's what I do for a living that's my specialty uh -huh. and so the reason why I'm saying this is the following that with the question of why does one disavow it one disavows it for a range of me meanings but part of it too I think is to say I am go I am gop is already in a sense to confess to a crime. Now there's plenty mm -hmm. of bragging about crimes, but there's mm -hmm. also that kind of disavowal of the very crime for which you are best equipped to carry out, you know, gop, namely gop stop. There's all kinds of prison right. songs about gop stop and so yes, forth. Yes, of course. No, so that's that, true. That have it too. But the thing is, that, again, I could be wrong about this, but I think the continuum going from gop stop to um, gopniki is that you know, gopniki are, um, 
you can be afraid of growth because you're afraid they're going to hurt you and they could be criminals. But identifying someone as a gopnik isn't necessarily identifying them as someone who has committed a crime. Um, it's identifying as someone as um, this particular type of person. Um, they might not have a record. Um, so it's, I don't think if you say I'm a gopnik, it means then you should arrest me. And in fact, um, you could have, exactly. yeah, um, I think it, it's, it's, it's several steps away from that. Yeah, I'm suggesting that it's information as to why people would consistently, you know, not want to self-identify that way. Sure, sure. And that, that's my point. Mm -hmm. Okay, we've got a bunch of questions. Sure. And, um, just one comment before we move on to the next uh, question. Yulia um, had noted in the chat, uh, I think that in this respect, Gorpinki are like hipsters in the Russian context. People don't self-identify as hipsters. This term is used by mm -hmm. others, usually critically. At least that was yeah. the case around 2013, 2016. Right. And actually in, in, in English too, I don't think hipsters identify themselves as, as hipsters um, without a great deal of irony because, um, yeah, because it's, it's kind of gross. Um, so yeah, I would agree that, that this, is, this is something um, that there, there are more than one category out there that, that are, are um, identified by the outside, not by the inside. Um, Margaret, if you want to um, ask your question, I can unmute you now. Okay, yeah, so um, when I've been in Russia recently, the people that I saw squatting were all Central Asian. And mm -hmm. I was really surprised to see your, um, your title squatting Slavs because I, I didn't, that's not what I saw, at least in St. Petersburg. Right. No, and that's an excellent point. And that I think is really what part of what's going on here. Um, that um, one of the ways in which the squatting Slav is signaled, yeah, you don't have, like, when I say people around the world squat, squat all the time, um, people in Asia squat, and um, I'm trying not, I'm trying not to stigmatize on my own, and I'm trying to see squatting as a neutral thing, but people all over Asia squat, right? Yeah. Um, and if you're setting up um, something funny about being a Russian who squats, there's a racial component to it, which is that, you know, you shouldn't be squatting because you're like those people, right? Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so squat, you know, squatting is unmarked if you're Asian, but being Asian itself is marked, right? right? Um, so if we're talking about this kind of hierarchy of quote unquote civilized behavior and how and you know why it gets stigmatized within Russia and then how that plays outside as well, it's really outside of Russia. It's, it's seeing all these white people squatting, um, and within within Russia, I would say that it's, you know, it, um, if you think of civilization as pointing towards Europe, and I'm saying all of these things in quotes, right, but um, then there's something uncultured about um, continuing or replicating this behavior that is, um, that you associate with these um, Central Asian workers whom you're already looking down on anyway. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, Allison, if you want to ask your question now, I can unmute you. Yeah, sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hi, Allison. Hi. I'm actually thrilled to be asking my question after Margaret because I, I was sort of wondering if she might go in this direction too. And, and I apologize because what I have is actually not a question but a comment, but I know that you're asking for comments in terms of developing this work. And I couldn't help but think as you were talking about disagreement about where this term even comes from, what its etymology is, about you know, images of lower class people, not exactly squatting in the 19th century, but there is a kind of vein in you know, realist painting, like yeah. in, in terms of Vasily Perov. And you might even look at something like Surikov's uh, Boyarina Morozova, this huge crowd where you don't see people squatting, but you do see people sitting either so low to the ground that their knees are really hiked up, but in a way that's very evocative of what you're describing, mm -hmm. and very, very classed. I mean, I'm thinking of the, the image of the holy fool in that painting is the one who's sitting in, in this way that's not, it's not exactly squatting, but I don't know, you just might look at, at there being a deeper class aspect to this that goes totally. back into the 19th century even. No, that's a very good observation because as soon as you say it, I can conjure these things up right, um, right in, in front of me. There's, um, yeah, it's, there's something I think inherent, inherently undignified about the squatting position, which um, makes, which helps um, mark it as lower class, uncultured, um, and then it fits in very well with these, I guess, genre paintings or, um, 
um, from the 19th century. Yeah, that um, totally makes sense. The difference being in the 19th century, frankly, everybody had to squat at some point, um, <laughs> which is not necessarily the case now. All right, uh, we have a question from Peter in the chat. Is, is Putin a, a gopnik? Uh, no, <laughs> that would be my short answer. No, um, in part because he's not hanging out on the street asking for money and he's not dressed like that. But I, um, is your question, is there some like commonality between um, Putin and his image in the gopnik? Um, I mean, there's, there's a continuum of tough guy, certainly, um, that, they're, that they're all on, um, but well, Putin- there was some, uh, in the early period of Putin, there was talk about him as a tough street kid from uh, right. Petersburg, Leningrad. Oh, so like, was he a Gopnik growing up? Yeah. Yeah. No, well, and also I, the I, language, right? Remember the early language, he was going to get the Chechen, the, the terrorists in their, you know. Absolutely. In the toilet. Yeah, but that's, but you know. Yes, in the toilet. Very, that's a nice way to put toilet. it. Yeah, um, there's something very, um, deliberate though i think about using that sort of language that um that he was doing um that men can do to show they're tough but in part of a larger um conversational framework in which they are also showing their that they're educated and intelligent and that you know um Pu the way putin can hold forth on television um uh in long periodic sentences um talking at great length about things the way soviet leaders always could do before um is not um, a particularly, not a Gopnik style. Um, so I would say that what he's doing is, it's not, when he talks like that, he's not accessing specifically Gopnik culture, but he's, ask, he's accessing a particular type of um, rough masculinity that Gopnik culture is part of. Okay, thanks. All right. Um, Olga, we have a question from, from Olga in the chat, uh, and uh, apologies if I uh, don't pronounce this correctly. So is there a connection between the Lyubery, Lube, uh, Lubers of the 1980s? Yeah. Uh, is there a possibility that the Gopnik culture will cease to exist with any drastic social and political changes in Russia, like the Lyubery with the collapse of the Soviet Union? Or is this, the, uh, or is this subculture less dependent on the political regime? Hmm. Well, definitely. I, I mean, as I said before, there's a connection with, with the whole Lubra thing. Um, you know, wh are, will the Gopniki still be around? I mean, there's a question, are they really around as a real phenomenon anyway, right? Um, I think the, the, the question is more, are we going to identify people as Gopniki um, as time goes on? And will it mean the same thing? Um, and I would guess that as long as there's class stratification, um, there will be if not a phen the phenomenon that we're calling Gopniki, um, a phenomenon or a, a group of, in particular, young men who will be um, stigmatized or looked down upon in a way like um, one did with the Gopniki, um, even if we call them something else and even if their style is different, um, because this is a very common phenomenon involving anxieties about um, lower class men. Uh, and we have a question from Otto. Um, how does class intersect with race in the conception of the Gopnik? Well, the thing with race, of course, is that um, that unlike you know in America, where everything is seen, you know, race is our is one of our first lenses to which we look through things. So, so to the point where we lose sight of class, um, that race is one of the few ways that we can talk about class in America. Um, in Russia, I would flip it around in that there isn't there hasn't been a, a very developed public discourse talking about race within Russia. And the terminology that is used is different from um, what we'd use in, in, in American English. Um, there, now, um, so, but it's still, so in, in, you know, in Russian, for instance, it's less about whiteness than Europeanness. Europeanness stands in for whiteness, like in the ads where you, um, in the um, ads for subletting apartments where you only um, sublet to, to people of Slavs or Europeans, not to, they presumably not to Asians, Central Asians. Um, the race aspect um, comes in, in that, you know, a Gopnik is a, you know, a, Gopnik is a Slav, right? A Gopnik is um, someone who could be 
like you, the Russian, you, the Slav, you, the white person, as we might would say in English, um, but um, is acting in a way that um, is a bit is in some way um, uh, deviant um, from this norm of um, respectable, what we'd say in, in English, respectable whiteness. Um, so there's not a good way to be, I, I, it's hard for me to conceive of how you, how you could be, say, a Central Asian Gulfnik. Um, so that's, I think, where race comes into it. But I don't think, but I don't think when people in Russia are talking about Gulfniki, they think they're talking about race. We have a question from Olga. Um, in the Soviet Union, the term Gulfnik was not very popular. I personally never used it. Now I'm now in my 60s and lived there before the 90s and have only heard it a few times. Uh, does it come from the criminal world or where does it originate? Well, that is the question, right? I mean, so there, there's a theory that it comes from the criminal world. There's a theory that it comes from the, back from these abbreviations that I mentioned um, early on. Um, so it was around, but it wasn't very common. Um, and it didn't really um, take off until, until um, the late 80s and 90s. So that would explain why you wouldn't have, have heard it so much. Um, but as I said, there's differences of opinion as to where the term comes from. In the question from Dennis, do you see any overlap with Serbian turbo folk? Is there a place where they would share space in a Venn diagram? Oh, absolutely. And in fact, um, there is a, a subset of um, squatting Slav um, phenomenon on the internet that does involve Serbia. Um, and so, um, tur so turbo the, the aesthetics of turbo folk and the politics associated with turbo folk um, are on a continuum where on this Venn diagram, I'm not sure where I'd put them on the Venn diagram, but they belong, they certainly belong on the same page. Um, but, um, but I'm not sure exactly how close, but there are, there are definite affinities certainly. And a question from Lisa, are Gorpniki a subset of hooligans? Sure, yeah, <laughs> um, absolutely. But um, hooligans, I mean, the, 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 there's a question of how, how, of how these terms are deployed, right? On the one hand, um, hooligan is a kind of, you can see it as a kind of general conversational thing as a way of referring to someone as being a hooligan, and you could say it as also as a, in a kind of joking fashion. Um, there's also the, the way in which um, it uh, overlaps into legal code, you know, hooligans and all of that. Um, so, but being a hooligan is not, is not, I think, a subcultural question. Um, it's a question of, um, of behavior, of, it's a question of behavior and mores. Um, but really, I think a hooligan, you can, be, you can become a hooligan at any moment, right? You can, and you can engage in hooliganstva. Um, but just because you're engaged in hooligans, it doesn't necessarily make you a gopnik. But um, if you're a gopnik, I think you're, you, the assumption is that you, you are engaged in hooligans, even if you're not actually engaged in hooligans at the, at the moment. And a question from Tanya. Uh, thank you, Elliot. Gopniki are also often featured as characters in music videos by Leningrad. There we yes. often see them functioning as a proverbial Ivan Durak kind of character. Yes not particularly talented and intelligent, but strangely succeeding in the end. Uh, for instance, in the videos, VIP or a candidate. Would you yeah. say there is a particular kind of attitude to the Gopnik culture projected by Leningrad? Yeah, I mean, but th by that point, the Gopnik culture is, um, it's, it's gotten to this point where it's less threatening and just sort of more, more fun, right? There's a, um, when I, when I use the phrase domesticated and then had a problem with it because of course they're, they're people of, of the street, um, enough time has passed so that, yeah, you can, you can, um, the Gopni can just become as, Ling I think Lingrad uses them as a kind of folk cultural figure. Um, and there's a way in which a lot, not just in the Gopni character that appears in the Lingrad videos, but there's a kind of aesthetic that, that um, Lingrad videos will appropriate um, for, for other characters as well as kind of in your face, um, roughness um, that can become kind of charming. Um, but I think, I don't think, it, I don't think it would have been as li likely to do that with the Gopni character, say, 15 years ago, um, where, because now they're just, they're, they're, they're so thoroughly assimilated as to be much less threatening. And once, you know, once you have whole magazines making fun of them, and once there's Gopni fashion on the runway, um, they do become available for kind of Ivan Dora character, absolutely. 
uh, and a comment slash question uh, from Alexandra. I'm wondering whether there had been a change in the meaning of the word Gopnik. Thinking of the Zoa Park song, Gopniki produced in the late 1980s, where the Gopniki were already framed as the antithesis to Zoa Park's lead singer, Mike Naumenko's rocker identity, but primarily in terms of taste. He describes the Gopniki as those who listen to heavy metal, Soviet pop music, and Boney M, and who dress in particular ways like wearing red socks and soldier boots, i.e. doing all the things a self-respecting representative of counterculture, rocker, or hippie would never do. 30 years later, we definitely don't think of the Gopniki this way. Right, so this is an excellent question. So the, the, sty the stylistic elements that are, that are identified there um, don't um, last or don't obtain to, to Gopniki over, over time. But what does fit um, is, and what makes them you know, not really work as a subculture, is you had the whole category that I think um, Zoe Park is dealing with here of the Niformale, right? These um, people who were um, acting in a way that is not, you know, not conventional and whose tastes were not conventional and who marked themselves as being outside convention. Um, and the Gopniki's function there was to kind of enforce convention to, um, you know, they're there to beat up the people who are stepping out of line, right? Um, and so what they like is very, very, um, well, not neutral, but very obvious, um, very you know, mainstream in its way. Um, and so they, um, they're enforcing a kind of mainstreamness against all of this, this um, deviant um, style like the rocker or the hippie. Um, and so I think that opposition to the, de to, um, to the, to um, Niformalia, to the, that kind of deviance remains, but the style of the Gopniki starts to really, um, to con concretize around you know the track suits and so on and so forth, and, but I think the problem is that once the style of the Gopniki becomes so identifiable as track suits and um, cigarettes and so on and so forth, um, the Gop the one of the reasons that Gopniki can't really be identified as an actual group is that they're a parody, or um, uh, they're a kind of um, yeah they're 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 um, yeah they've been reduced to um, these obvious elements that mark them, and that's why they can become so amusing for things like the the um, Goperia's magazine and um, eventually become you know, kind of style icons um, because they're so um, limited as um, as signs to so such um, a specifically narrow um, range of um, presentation. And um, apologies, I'm going to mispronounce this name. I think a uh, question from iCenter. Uh, is the Gopnik fashion style being appropriated by middle class young men in Russia, similarly to how hippie style is appropriated? Um, I can't, I think actually Tanya could answer better. Um, uh, Tanya Efremova, who's worked in this stuff. Um, I mean, the fact that it's runway street style fashion would suggest yes, um, but I don't have firsthand evidence of it. Tanya, what would you say? I, yeah, um, I wouldn't say middle class. I would say our, it's kind of popular with our specific also kind of sub um, subgroup of our, um, contemporary youth. And it's very much targeting youth culture. So I wouldn't say um, mid, middle class hipsters are that much into Gosh Rukchinsky. Um, but people who are as, identify as... Um, Mm, skaters are listeners of like alternative techno music. Those would be the ones who actually save money to buy Gosh Rubchinsky in Russia. Whereas when we think about abroad, uh, in the Western, are uh, and I would say even global fashion scene, uh, yeah, absolutely, hipsters and um, middle class uh, consumers are. Um, go for all of these uh, um, drops in Soho boutiques. So as uh, I would say in the West, yes. Uh, in Russia, not so much. I mean, in the West also it seems like, isn't there, there's a little bit of, of overlap or not even overlap, but there's, there's a way in which it starts to get a little bit close to some hip hop fashion. Kind of. The bagginess, you know. Mm. Yeah, yeah, really? yeah. hip hop. Um, I wouldn't say hip hop would be the dominant musical style there. I would say techno because it's rave culture more than. Oh, I don't, oh, I didn't mean musical style. I meant uh, clothing style. A clothing style, yeah, for sure. Yeah, definitely. Tough guys. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, and um, a question from Olga in the chat. Adidas has been a symbol of capitalist values since the Soviet times. Why do you think the unique Russian subculture of Gorpniks got merged specifically with this brand and not Puma, Kappa, or other activewear brands? If Adidas was the signifier of a special status uh, in the Soviet Union, the Gopniks connections with Adidas nowadays seem to have an entirely different meaning. It seems that it is the Gopnik culture that makes Adidas items more exclusive. They cost more than regular Adidas brands, thus contributing to the further stratification of society. I think the, the notion of Gopnik fashion connected with Adidas now has a real retro flavor to it, right? I mean, because Adidas was, Adidas was the default um, you know, around the turn of the 80s to 90s, you know, in terms of what people wanted, right? They wanted the Adidas shoes um, and the Adidas track suits. And then you get, so the track suit, I mean, the track suit starts out is a much broader clothing signifier than just Gopnik, or it starts out that way, right? Because the track suit was what um, basically criminals of all stripes, literally, I suppose, given the Adidas track suit, of all stripes um, wore. Um, and it was the clear, and so so one of the ways that the Gopnik um, meme works, I think, in the West is you already still have in the West this notion of the kind of Russian thug or Russian criminal in a tracksuit. Um, now, you know, I think on the whole, a self-respecting Russian criminal, um, you know, uh, someone with money doesn't wear the um, tracksuit anymore. There's, there's there's something very '90s about the tracksuit. Um, but the, the Gopnik is still wearing the tracksuit. And by the time you get to these images I'm seeing, that I'm showing you, they feel very staged and posed, right? I mean, I, I, it doesn't seem to me like we're watching people in their natural habitat and walking around, oh, I'm going to, while I'm here, I may as well squat for you. Um, I have the sense of dress up, let's put on the tracksuit to be a Gopnik um, and then squat for you. Um, so th that Adidas thing is, um, I think that the, the thing about it in terms of style is how, it, how it's you know, not as much, the thing that makes it stylish for the Gopnik is for the Gopnik image is that it's not so stylish anymore, right? I mean, Adidas is is kind of old news, um, isn't it? I mean, it's very, very. Um, it seems to me very, very '90s. Again, like, those of you who actually keep up with fashion would have a better sense of it. Uh, and oh, a question from Alexandra: Is Goparez a real magazine or just a parody? What's the difference? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a parody, um, and you get it for free online as a PDF. Yeah, I mean, so it, it's, I talked about it as like a Gopnik Vogue or a Gopnik um, Glamour in the sense of parody, like imagine that a Gopnik were buying Glamour, this is what it'd be, not like, let's go and find Gopnik here and see if they're going to buy our, our Gopnik magazine because they'll see themselves in it and, and, and really um, love it. No, it, it is definitely a parody, um, but it's still you know, a magazine of its sort. Um, but no, it's not being marketed um, like Glamour would be. It's so much fun though. I, I, you can get it, it's very easy to get online and I, I just highly recommend it. Uh, and a few, few more comments uh, from Yulia. Speaking of hip hop, Alona Alona often alludes to Gorpnik aesthetics, for example. Um, and also from Olga, Adidas has had a comeback in the US in, in the past five or six years. In the U.S. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Um, but not not just in the U.S. I think in Russia too, especially with the World Cup, we had like this very um, highly promoted um, line, um, specifically associated with uh, the World Cup taking place in Russia, and Adidas was involved in uh, creating a special collection. Mm, and uh, yeah, uh, I would say hipsters are after Adidas and uh, um, specific uh, yeah collections that are more niche, like special drops. It's it's global. But like like the like track suits, like those track suits. Track suits not so much. Mostly no, sneakers. Okay. Sneakers. Oh yeah, sneakers are definitely sneakers. No question. Yeah. Um, no, and, and when I was talking about being out of style, I specifically meant this kind of leisure wear, right? Ah, okay. Um, yeah. Well, sportswear also. I wouldn't say uh, sportswear is completely, but not so much truck suits, just like, I guess, um, yoga pants kind of sports. Yeah, but not like the, there's something very matchy-matchy about the track suit, you know, that's, um, which in my head is sort of like, the, you know, goes back to the, you know, the one denim rule um, that everybody used to break over there as well, that um, I, Again, I really could be wrong, so please correct me if I'm if, if I'm if I'm wrong on this. Um, I wasn't imagining a return to that like complete, you know, Adidas head to toe in a kind of onesie look, 
look that you have with a tracksuit. Um, but or is that back as well? No, that is not back. <laughs> it's very nineties, and I think it's yeah. specifically recognized as nine. It's the nineties. Exactly. It, it's like if you want to if you want to show nineties. Right, yeah. right. If it's a nineties yeah. themed party, absolutely. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Wear your tracksuit to your nineties themed party. That does sound like lots of fun. Okay, I think that's that's everything unless anybody else has any more questions. Oh, sorry, we do have one more question uh, from Andrew. Uh -huh. You said that oh, yeah. the non-Russian internet picked up the Gopnik meme in 2012 because of 4chan. Do we know which board on 4chan first started using the Gopnik meme? So um, to, to paraphrase Game of Thrones, I believe it is known um, which 4chan board uh, it started on. I do not remember. Um, I think I have it in my notes somewhere, but I don't remember which one. Um, I think that sort of thing is, is, is not too hard to find, but I don't remember where it came from. All right. Well, thanks everybody for joining us this week. It was uh, great to see all of you here again. Elliot will be back. We now know for at least one or two more weeks uh, and more if we can feed him topics. Uh, so we'll hope to see you here. <laughs> so we'll hope to see you here uh, next week as well at the same time. Uh, and also just again, a shout out for our first virtual New York City Russia public policy event, which will be noon on Thursday on Russia in the time of COVID-19. So hope to see as many of you there as possible. And if you can help us publicize it, we'll be very grateful. Thanks everybody. And thanks Elliot once again, totally Thank fascinating. You. Great to see you all. Thank you everyone. Bye.